Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Ah, Adriana just made it. So welcome to the last day of the IB conference. I hope you all had a good night. I think we had a good party last night, so it was nice to see all of you clearly and, and we really enjoyed a nice banquet. I'm Thibaut Lefebvre from, from CERN and uh, today I will share the session on longitudinal diagnostics. In that session we have four talks so we need to you know, keep the time if we don't want to push the coffee break for, for too long. Uh, <coughs> we start with two invited talks and then this will be followed by two contributed talks. And it's my pleasure to invite the first speaker, Rio Kitamura from G-Park to actually join. Rio got his PhD in physics at the University of Tokyo in 2019, working on the demonstration of muon acceleration with radio frequency quadruple Linux. He received a student encouragement award from the Muon and Meson Science Society in Japan in 2019 and the Young Scientist Award from the Physics Society of Japan in 2020 for his doctoral dissertation. He started working at G-Park as a postdoc post fellow in 2018 and took a permanent staff position as a researcher in 2020. His current research interests are focusing on beam dynamics and beam instrumentation challenges for the high power proton beam injector which includes space charge effects and emittance growth control. And he will talk today about the first measurement of longitudinal profile of high power low energy H minus beam using a bunch shape monitor and a graphite target. Please Rio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So good morning. So um, first of all, um, I appreciate the um, opportunity to present my recent research activity in j -Park. So uh, this work uh, supported by uh, many colleagues, not only the JPAC Renac team, but also the whole uh, the accelerator division colleagues, including the RCS and the mailing people. So uh, thank you very much. So okay, uh, today's my talk is about the uh, development of the uh, longitudinal band shape monitor for the uh, front end of the JPAC Renac. So as uh, an introduction. I'd like to explain the uh, brief of our JPAC RENAC and uh, our band shape monitor for the front end. So to measure the uh, longitudinal uh, beam profile at the front end, we have to develop the uh, new kind of target material, uh, new kind of target for the uh, front end band shape monitor. And several beam tests was conducted uh, with the band shape monitor using this new kind of material that is a graphite target. And then, as a first step of the uh, beam commissioning, we conducted uh, the longitudinal measurement using this uh, band shape monitor. So I'd like to show you this result and uh, the red me summary talk at the end. Okay. So in the in uh, oh. so that's the big one. In principle, yeah, you should shoot on it. It's not working. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so the previous way. And so, okay, introduction. So, you know, the uh, Japan Proton Accelerator Research Complex, JPAC, consists of three kind of high power uh, accelerator. So, from the upstream side, 400 MeV Linux, and 3 GB rapid cycle synchrotron, we call RCS, and 30 GB uh, mainling. A synchrotron we call it MR. So okay. So and this uh, so figure shows the schematic drawing of the, uh, our JPAC 400 MB Linux. So there are four kind of accelerating cavities uh, from the upstream side: the RFQ and DTL and uh, SDTL and SES up to the 400 MB acceleration. Okay. So the uh, JPAC Renac accelerate the, uh, the negative hydrogen ions, uh, ion H minus beam with a peak current of uh, 50 milliampere in current user operation. And uh, beam studies at the front end uh, being conducted to reduce the beam loss in the Linux. So one of the important matching section is uh, MV, uh, medium energy beam transport one. We called MEBT1. 
located between the RFQ and DTL. So this uh, MEBT1 should uh, be tuned to mitigate the emittance growth due to the spatial effect uh, for the recent user operation. To do that, the both transverse and longitudinal matching are uh, required for the high power beam operation. So our motivation is understanding and improving the uh, longitudinal beam dynamics at the MEBT1. So uh, the configuration of our MEBT1, this uh, figure shows the schematics of our MEBT1. So there are two functions of the MEBT1. The first one is uh, beam matching between the RFQ and DTL. To do that, we use the eight quadrupole magnet and the two bunch of cavities in the MEBT1. And the second one is uh, to make the uh, bunch structure for the RCS in injection. To make this uh, time structure, we use this RF chopper system and uh, including the beam scraper. The raw energy that is a 3 MeV H minus beam in the MeVT1 is uh, strongly affected by the space charge force. So, uh, however, uh, compared with uh, transverse uh, monitors, uh, that is a wire scanner monitor in the MEBT1, four, four monitor installed. Um, but, so we, <coughs> but the uh, longitudinal monitor was insufficient when we start this work. So, a um, new band shape monitor was installed in uh, MEBT1 for the uh, longitudinal beam matching. So the band shape monitor, the, the, it is a standard longitudinal beam profile monitor for the RENAC. And this figure shows uh, the schematic drawing of our JPAC band shape monitor and uh, its principle. So hey you see. Uh, I'm sorry, could, could you speak a bit closer to the mic? I think that we have problems oh. to hear you in sorry. the audience. Thank um, oh, okay. So, um, so we use the so-called fast chunk type uh, band shape monitor, and uh, the principle of this BSM, the secondary electrons are produced in the very uh, interaction between the uh, H minus B and the BSM target to extract the secondary electron. And secondary electrons related to the longitudinal profile of the uh, original H minus beam are modulated by the air field in the BSM deflector into the uh, transverse profile. So that is the principle. So, and the, the, so uh, the problem of the uh, BSM in the MEBT1 is uh, heat loading. So, this heat loading derived from the uh, high power beam in the MEBT1 cause the target wire frequent, uh, target wire, target wire break, breaking frequently uh, during the beam commissioning. So we, um, the new uh, BSM target material for the uh, uh, bunch of uh, MEBT1 was uh, developed uh, using this graphite material. So the, uh, the candidate material of the uh, BSM target, so the, there are three uh, kind of uh, uh, three, uh, there are three candidate material for the band shape monitor target to mitigate the heat loading for the uh, H minus beam in MEBT1. So the tungsten and carbon nanotube, a CMT wire, and graphite. So the, that is a highly oriented pyrolytic graphite we called HOPZ. Okay, the first one, the tungsten which is used as a standard target material for the BSM. However, the wire breaking frequently occurs due to the heat loading for in the uh, MEBT1, so it is not, not good for our usage. So the second one is uh, CMT, which is used for the uh, wire scanner monitor to measure the transverse profile in the MEBT1. The, its low density is uh, really suitable uh, f to mitigate the heat loading as shown in this table compared with the uh, tungsten. So it looks good. And the third one, graphite HOPZ, 
So which, which is used as a, a candidate material for the development of the beam scraper originally not for the beam instrumentation. And its high thermal conductivity is uh, very suitable for to mitigate the heat loading compared with these two um, materials. And the, uh, this plot shows uh, the simple temperature calculation for uh, these materials. So we can see the good characteristics for the CNT and the HOPZ compared with the uh, tungsten. So these looks are uh, nice for a bunch of monitor. So the question is, so which is really better for our bunch of monitor? Okay, let's start with uh, CNT. The, um, the CNT has been used for the uh, stable target wire for the wire scan monitor in MEBT1 already, as shown in this uh, photograph. And it is easy to replace the CNT wire with uh, tungs original tungsten wire as shown in this uh, photograph. This is a mounted uh, CNT wire on the bunch of monitor. And uh, this image shows the, our, uh, our bunch of uh, our CNT wire uh, with a diameter of 0 0.1 millimeter we use. So here, let us consider the que one question. So the, uh, can the negative bias voltage be applied to the CNT to extract the secondary electron as a BSM operation? So please remember the uh, BSM principle. So to confirm this issue, the offline test of applying the bias voltage was conducted at the test bench. However, the, the, you know, the CNT is uh, well, well known as uh, its electron emission properties. Uh, for example, the cold cathode for the ion source. The, uh, our result of a flying test, um, unfortunately, the, this purple luminescence from the insulator ceramic uh, by the field emission was uh, clearly observed. And uh, this plot shows the uh, result of the spectroscopic measurement for CNT. The spectrum peak due to the field emission was clearly observed. And the uh, right figure showed the uh, dependence of the vacuum pressure and weak current for the CNT and HOPZ. So you can see this peak. So this peak uh, means the wire breaking of the CNT. So as a result, unfortunately, and the field emission uh, from the CNT was really serious for the uh, BSM operation. So actually, we cannot use the CNT for the, our bunch of monitor in MABT1. But on the other hand, the, uh, we can successfully apply the bias voltage to the uh, HOPZ as shown in this plot. So, okay, next one is uh, HOPZ. So this HOPZ is originally the candidate material of the beam scraper in MEBT1. This is the, beam, uh, the photograph of the beam scraper in MEBT1. So you know, it, it's um, high thermal conductivity is suitable to mitigate the heat loading in MEBT1. And also, uh, it was easy to apply the negative bias voltage from the result of the uh, offline test, you know. So it looks nice, very nice for the bunch of monitor. However, um, let us consider the new uh, question. That is the target size. So the, the target size of the HOPZ is about one millimeter square. So this is uh, slightly uh, thicker than the uh, CNT wire or tungsten wire. Uh, its uh, diameter is about 0.1 millimeter. So another question, the, does the thick uh, HOPG target affect the measurement of the longitudinal profile in the MABT1? So um, the beam test of the target size effect of the bunch of monitor using HOPG, so we, we call it uh, HOPG BSM, was conducted. 
Okay, the test stand in the JPAC Linux building was uh, used for the beam test in the HOPZ. So this uh, figure shows the schematic drawing of our test stand. The test stand consists of uh, H minus ion source and 3 MAB RFQ and diagnostic big line are shown here. The BSM was installed in the, this diagnostic beam line after the 3 MAB RFQ and the beam conditions were almost the same as the MAB T1. So that is uh, the peak current is about, about uh, 15 milliampere, the energy is 3 MeV, the pass length is 50 microsecond and the rep rate is 1 hertz. The uh, during the this beam test the stability test of HOPG target was conducted. So we conducted the six hours per day irradiation for months. And uh, after that we observed the uh, use HOPZ and uh, visually no damage of the HOPZ. So this uh, photograph shows the new HOPZ and uh, used HOPZ after the beam test. So it looks fine. So okay, let me uh, explain the uh, study of the target size effect. So for this test, uh, two types of HOPG target were prepared. So the, uh, the dimensions are shown in this figure: the length and thickness and the width. The difference is uh, width direction. The large target. Uh, for the large target, the width is 1.0 millimeter, and for small one, the width is 0.2 millimeter. So this uh, minimum size is limited by the its cutting method of HOPZ. The target size affects the uh, time of flight of extracted secondary electron. So please remember the uh, BSM principle again. So as expectation. The large target smear the uh, the measured longitudinal profile with the band shape monitor. So and then this target uh, TOF effect was estimated by the joint force simulation and corrected into the uh, measurement result. So this is the result. So the uh, this is the uh, profile with a small HOPZ and uh, profile with a large HOPZ and corrected. H of B, uh, profile with a small H of PZ. So let us uh, check the comparison between the large one and the corrected. So we can, uh, the, the, uh, the profile with the large uh, target uh, con uh, were consistent with uh, corrected profile. So with this method, the, the target size effect was well confirmed. So uh, the subsequent uh, analysis in the beam test, we used this correction method for the analysis. Okay, next let me explain the, uh, the tuning of the horizontal target position uh, for the BSM measurement. The HOPG target position was tuned to measure the uh, longitudinal beam profile at the beam center. The, uh, this horizontal profile was uh, measured by detecting the uh, current induced uh, in the HOPG target. So, which is the same method as the uh, uh, usual wire scanner monitor. So, the measured uh, horizontal profile with the band shape monitor using HOPZ was well consistent with the uh, wire scanner monitor result using the CNT wire at the same uh, beam, the, uh, beam rate position. So, this is the result. So. The profile is very consistent. Okay, now here uh, let us consider another idea. So, the, the can uh, if we can measure the uh, whole uh, beam profile in on the any uh, the horizontal position, so can the dependence of longitudinal profile with measured in the terms of the this horizontal direction? If do so. The longitudinal uh, and the transverse profile can be measured with this uh, HOPZ BSM in the MABT1. So, okay, we uh, did it. So um, here, the, uh, we measure the longitudinal profile at whole 
uh, horizontal position. So the uh, longitudinal uh, so that's the phi uh, phase direction and the horizontal x direction profile, 2D profile were measured. So this shows the result of this uh, two, two D profile. And then uh, the characteristics of the MEBT1, you know, the space charge effect strongly affect the beam profile in MEBT1. So as expectation, the longitudinal and the transverse profile are uh, coupled under the uh, space charge effect in the MEBT1. So uh, in test stand, the uh, collateral pole magnet for X focusing was turned on, and then we measure the 2D profile as shown in this photograph. And then compared with uh, uh, profile with uh, the turn off, uh, the change of 2D profile was successfully observed with our uh, HOPZ BSM. Okay, so the, uh, that means the transverse horizontal uh, the, uh, focusing affect the longitudinal profile through the uh, space charge force. So the dependence of the, uh, this uh, phi x profile, 2D profile was measured by scanning the horizontal uh, Q magnet focusing. And then this is the result. Um, the, uh, we think correlation between the uh, longitudinal transverse profile was observed now. So it means the uh, HOPZ was a really interesting instrument to study the space charge effect in the MABT1. And using this uh, procedure, uh, ideally, we can uh, the correlate it between the, uh, the horizontal, vertical, and the longitudinal uh, profile can be observed in the MEBT1. So um, the HOPZ is uh, uh, really variable to develop the frontier of the hyper beam operation in the JPAC MEBT1. So okay, the last topic. So as a first step of uh, beam commissioning in the uh, real MABT1, the longitudinal beam parameter, such as the longitudinal twist and the uh, emittance were measured using this uh, HOPZ BSM. So we used amplitude uh, scan method with a bunch of cavity here. And required time for this scan is about one hour per scan with HOPZ BSM. The uh, when the amplitude of the bunch of cavity was scanned and the dependence of longitudinal profile was uh, successfully observed as expected. So this figure shows the, the top, uh, top figure shows the waveform with the strong focusing and the uh, bottom figure shows the pro, uh, waveform with the weak focusing. We can observe the uh, nice difference. And the procedure to uh, evaluate the longitudinal beam parameter. So in the experiment, we conducted the amplitude scan using the bunch of cavities. And then uh, after the beam test, we uh, conducted the simulation uh, by the, uh, the uh, PIC code. The uh, we use the 3D PIC code, uh, particle insert code, uh, impact code. And then in the simulation, we conducted the virtual uh, amplitude scan and uh, make the uh, profile, a longitude profile on the BBSM position and comparison between the uh, measurement result and the simulation, taking into account it, the uh, BSM response. So that is uh, the uh, resolution and the uh, TOF effect for the, uh, the MEBT1. So um, considering this uh, comparison, the, uh, the we modified the uh, initial uh, parameter slightly, and then uh, this loop was processed, and then finally we uh, estimate the best value of the uh, initial this parameter at the alpha exit uh, using the experimental data and simulation. Okay. The longitude profile was first uh, measured with uh, HOPZ BSM by scanning the, uh, the, uh, the bunch of uh, amplitude like this. And then the, this the, is a uh, fitting cup 
the fitting curve of the amplitude scan by impact was uh, well consistent with the sh uh, measurement result. Also, so for each data, the simulated uh, longitudinal profile was also well consistent with the simulation as shown in this plot. So the estimated the initial twist parameter reproduced the uh, experimental result here. Then the design twist parameter were calculated using the ion source and RFQ simulation. So this uh, figure shows the uh, comparison of the longitudinal apes at RFQ exit. The measurement was well consistent with the uh, design simulation for the uh, twi longitudinal twist parameter and the emittance. So in conclusion, the, uh, our BSM and the MEBT1 system are well understood in the high power operation uh, in, in uh, current user operation. Okay. Uh, last re uh, let me summarize my talk. So um, now the new uh, bunch of monitor has been developed to measure the high power and low energy beam in the MEBT1. And the performance evaluation of the uh, bunch of monitor using the uh, HOPZ target, the B HOPZ BSM was conducted in this work. The first measurement of longitudinal beam profile was demonstrated using the HOPZ BSM and measurement was very consistent with the design simulation of our MEBT1. As a first uh, uh, applications, our new HOPZ BSM is a uh, really attractive and uh, powerful instrument to study the space charge effect in the front end. So that is JPAC MEBT. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rio. <laughs> Thanks for this very nice and comprehensive talk. So we open the, the talk for questions. So I must say, I st we still don't see, the, uh, at least from where I am, I still don't see very well the audience. So if there is any, there are a few raised hands, at least that I saw here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this <coughs> for this talk. Did you also investigated some aging effects? Um, so after after long time usage, whether there there is a change in the secondary electron emission um, coefficient? Or uh, and secondly, did you also test it um, for higher energies and basically for shorter bunches as well? Because the bunches are relatively long due to the low energy. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the uh, long term test, so um, in this work we uh, conducted all, only for the one month. And uh, yes, um, so for more long time or uh, one year or over one year, uh, we uh, actually we, we have to investigate. And uh, so the, the more quantitative uh, research like as uh, the, uh, the shift of the uh, SN ratio, for example, it, it is uh, also um, should be uh, investigated for uh, the future uh, com the commissioning test and uh, or additional test in the MABT1. Okay. Any other question from the audience? In, in the meantime, you, uh, I have a question. You, you mentioned this graphite target would actually, you see this as, a, as you know, a, one of the next material to be used for future machines. Wh where, do, where do you see the limit? You know, typically what kind of current and power would you, this, uh, this material with? Uh, with yes, um, the limitation of the maximum power is, uh, now we conducted uh, the 65 milliampere beam can be observed without the target failure. And uh, the, so we don't know uh, critical limit, but uh, the optimistic uh, one ca uh, summer calculation shows the around uh, 100 milliampere with a short pulse is okay. It's okay. So uh, actually, we have to test with uh, real beam. Okay. Thanks. Last chance. 
So I don't see any. Thanks again, Rio, for your Thank nice you very much. So we actually move to the second invited talk of the morning, which actually would have to be uh, uh, played with a pre-recorded talk, as uh, uh, as the speaker actually didn't manage to, to travel to uh, to Krakow. So the speaker is Imei Zhu. Uh, she got a PhD in 2020 in the University of Chinese Academy of Science, and she has been working in the field of uh, in the beam instrumentation group at the Shanghai Synchrotron Radiation Facility since then. Her research interests are linked to bunch by bunch diagnostics in electron storage ring. This include bunch by bunch beam position and phase measurements, as well as the beam related dynamic studies. So today she will actually talk about the experimental verification and the analysis of beam loading effects based on a precise bunch by bunch 3D beam position measurements. So hopefully now we should actually listen to her. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Thanks to SPC of IBIC 2022 for giving me the opportunity. I think we, we don't we don't hear anything. Online. My topic is uh, experimental could, could verification and analysis of for beam loading effect based on precise bunch by bunch three position measurement. My report mainly consists of three parts. First, I will. Uh, divide the, our motivation for why we want to study the beam loading effect and uh, why we use the bunch by bunch three position course. Secondly, I will introduce what instruments and the software tool we used to measure the relevant parameters. Then, I will present our experiment setup and uh, give some analysis of the results. It mainly improves the measurement and analysis of the accelerating phase shift, uh, as well as the signature tune and the damping time. Finally, I will make a summary of the in entire report. Now, uh, let's briefly review the concepts of the synchrotron motion and the beam loading effect in the electron storage rings. Under ideal conditions, the synchrotron motion of particles can be modeled as a simple, simple stamp harmonic oscillator. When discussing small oscillation ampl amplitudes relative to the synchronous phase, the longitudinal motion can be described by the equation on the right. The phase change of the particles uh, with respect to the synchronous particle can be described by the following two figures. When particles move around the circular orbit, higher energy particles have larger orb orb orbital radius, so they will arrive later. Likewise, particles with lower energy will arrive earlier. During this process, longitudinal focusing from a time-very accelerated field provided by an RF system will stabilize the particles to synchronous phase. The total energy, energy gain per turn depends on the energy of the accelerating field and the energy loss, energy loss due to synchronous radiation. As we can see, there are two important parameters in this equation. The synchrotron damping time and the synchrotron frequency, uh, which can be used to uh, evaluate the beam loading effect. The damping mainly comes from the synchrotron radiation energy loss. Furthermore, the increased uh, the, in, uh, the increase of synchrotron frequency differences between bunches will cause additional land-on damping. The synchrotron frequency mainly depends on the accelerating electric, electric field gradient. The larger the gradient is, the higher the synchrotron frequency will be. 
However, under practical conditions, the field distribution near the accelerating phase can be modified by the weak field, induced by the harmonic cavity and other vacuum components. Uh, so there will be some parameters changes. First, when the synchrotron radiation energy loss is unchanged, the accelerating phase will shift to ensure that the equivalent cavity voltage remains constant. Secondly, the electric field gradient change will cause the synchrotron frequency shift. Then, an increase in the synchrotron frequency spread uh, between bunches will cause an additional Landon damping, which would result in damping time shift. Finally, the distortion of the potential wear will cause bunch length change. Actually, there were no difference in parameters between bunches when they are uniformly filled. However, when the bunches are filled non-uniformly, for example, there are gaps between bunches chains or some difference between bunch charges, the accelerating field of each bunch will be inconsistent, which will cause characteristic parameters differences. As we all know, the beam loading effect mainly comes from non-uniform feeling, and uh, it will lead to possible beam uh, quality degradation and uh, increase the operational difficulty of uh, related systems, such as IF system and uh, beam feedback system. Therefore, the beam loading effect needs to be observed and uh, analyzed precisely to improve machine performance. The beam loading effect can be observed by several diagnostic tools. This report mainly involves four important parameters. They are bunch length, synchronous phase shift, synchronous frequency, and synchronous damping time. There are typical design values and uh, general variation due to the beam loading effect are uh, listed in the table. The strip camera is a traditional diagn diagnostic tool for the study of the beam loading effect, which is beneficial for bunch lens and uh, uh, synchronous phase shift measurements. A lot of great research work had been completed in many facilities, such as ARS and uh, Electro. However, the strip camera cannot provide bunch charge information and uh, excellent synchronous phase resolution. The bunch by bunch feedback processor can measure synchronous frequency and uh, synchronous damping time, but it requires additional uh, additional perturbation to the beam. Therefore, we built the bunch by bunch 3D position measurement system, which can realize undisturbed in situ measurements. The synchronous phase shift between bunches can be obtained by analyzing the steady state data. The synchronous frequency and the damping time can be obtained by analyzing the injection transient data using refuel charges as probe. Next, uh, I will introduce our diagnostic tool, the hot cap, and the software tool, stable. This is the system framework of the hot cap. The signal comes from the button BPM, which contains bunch charge, phase, and uh, position information. The hardware part includes an oscilloscope. Its uh, sample rate is uh, 10 GHz per channel, and uh, bandwidth is uh, up to 
4.2 GHz. Then, the data was collected and processed offline in the workstation. A correlation coefficient method, uh, best, uh, coefficient best method was applied, which includes the uh, construction of ultra-high time-resolved uh, response functions under the thread position information extraction algorithm. For more details, please refer to the literature. Here is the user interface of the hot cap. It can customize the input parameters and then directed, directed, uh, directly output the bound by bound thread position results, including the oscillation waveforms of the stored chart and the refilled chart. The hot cap has been successfully applied on the SSI and the HLS. Feel free to download it from the link below if you have any interest. We conducted a system test about the hot cap. The data was collected uniformly during user operation. The system can measure bunch by bunch charge, phase, and position simultaneously. PC method was used applied to evaluate the transverse position and the longitudinal phase measurement errors. Here are the results. The bunch by bunch charge resolution is 0.2% when the bunch charge is 0.6 narrow plus. The bunch phase resolution is 0.2 ps under the position resolution is 0.5 millimeters. This slide introduces our simulation tool, Stable. It is a newly developed accelerated tracking code that is currently only used for the longitudinal beam dynamic study and it is more efficient than the elegant code due to GPU computing. Then I will introduce the experiment data and show some results. The most important part is the measurement and analysis of the synchronous phase shift. The modulation of the bounce equilibrium acceleration phase is mainly derived from the correlation a correction of the beam wake field, which is an important parameter for evaluating the beam loading effect. We use the hot cap system to record the equilibrium acceleration phase data in the bounce train during different stages of user operation in the SSI. Before the harmonic cavity is stored, the impedance sources come from the main character, character cavity under the insertion devices. The phase distribution on, uh, is in the bunch train is shown in the first figure, and the phase shift is small, about uh, 1 ps. Once the harmonic cavity is stored, it becomes the main contributor to the narrow band in impedance. In the SSF, we installed a, harmonic cav a passive harmonic cavity. The phase distribution in the bounce chain is shown in the third and th uh, three, uh, second and third fi figures. They uh, they exhibit an approximately linear direction distribution with a different slope uh, on the different uh, detuning states. The phase shift is about 3 ps when the harmonic cavity is installed without working. However, when it works, the phase shift reaches 10 ps. The phase shift at the head and the tail of the train 
is a, a common value used to evaluate the stress of the beam loading effect. The following three figures show three different, fi different feeling patterns. The first one is filled with about 500 bunches uniform. The second picture shows a high bunch charge filled in the middle of the train. The last one shows a higher charge filled at the head and the tail. We measured the phase distribution in the bunch train by the hot cap, shown as the blue circles in the figure. And simulated the theoretical value by stable curve, sure as red stars. After that, we found they matched perfect. From the experiment, we can see that the phase distribution in the bunch chain is related to the bunch feeling pattern. When the total be the total current remains the same. The bound phase shift at the head and the tail of the train has a huge discrepancy between different charge distributions. Therefore, the slope K5 of the bound phase distribution on the approximately uniform feeling can be used as a more accurate parameter to evaluate the stress of the beam loading effect. The, the beam accumulation process is a good data acquisition window. During this process, the equilibrium phase distribution in the bunch chain under different beam currents was recorded. The results are shown below. The total current increases from 28 mA to 166 milliampers with 300 bunches filled uniform. The phase distribution in the train is approximately linearly decreasing under different currents. But their slope, slopes are linear and positively related to the total beam current. So we introduced a new constant, the change rate of the phase slope, k 5 l which is fully determined by the harmonic capital parameters. This slide shows the change rate of the phase slope for different bunch filling pattern under the same harmonic capital parameters. We plotted the phase slope versus total beam current. The first case is filled with 300 bunches and a gap of 420 buckets. The change rate of the phase slope is about 0.57. The second case is filled with 500 bunches and a gap of 220 bunches. The change rate of the space slope is about 0.22. Therefore, we can conclude that when the bunch filling gaps get larger, the change rate of the phase slope will be larger subsequently, which would lead to an enhanced beam loading effect. And uh, the conclusion is as expected. Then, we tried to compensate for the beam loading effect by increasing the bunch charge at the head and the tail of the trains with the same current and the same gaps. The feeling, feeling pattern are shown on the right. We compared the, the results between November 16th and uh, November, November, November 17th. The difference of the phase distribution in the bunch chain is, uh, under, the diff under the two feeling patterns is in the sub-PS sub order, and our system can cl clearly distinguish it.
with the compensation feeling, the inloading effect becomes weak when the phase shift slow of the main part in the bunch train becomes smaller. The other two important parameters for evaluating the beam loading effect are the signature frequency and the damping time. Next, I will introduce how to obtain the two parameters using the hard cap system and compare the results before and after the installation of the harmonic cavity in the SSI. The injection transient process of the top-up uh, top operation is a good research window where we can use a high sampling rate oscillator, uh, oscilloscope to collect data. Then we stripped out the field charge information from the injection, tra injection data and uh, extracted the synchronous frequency and the damping time by analyzing the longitudinal damping oscillation, oscillation process. The following equation was explained in the previous slide. In subsequent uh, apl uh, applications, we can evaluate the Landau damping con contribution and uh, longitudinal pot potential wear distortion by analyzing the variation of the longitudinal damping time with the beam current. Also, we can evaluate the longitudinal acceler uh, acceleration electric field distortion by analyzing the uh, variation of the signature frequency with the beam current. Now, we will present the measurement results whether the harmonic cavity works. The figures on the right show the longitudinal damping oscillation waveforms of the strict uh, field charge and the signature frequency can be obtained by mathematical model fitting. We plotted the signature frequency at a different beam current when the harmonic cavity detuned for uh, far from working frequency. Uh, it can be seen from the figures that the signature frequency is linearly related to the beam current and the change rate is 0 0.87. This also shows that uh, signature frequency differences can be distinguished at the order of the first by our system. Then, when the harmonic cavity is working, we also measure the change of the synchrotron frequency with the beam current. The change rate is 8.06, which is about 10 times larger than the detuned harmonic cavity. Furthermore, from the drift of the uh, synchrotron frequency with the beam current, we can judge that the harmonic cavity is still far from the best, uh, being, uh, best working condition. This can provide, a, pro provide a guidance for subsequent tuning of the harmonic cavity. From the longitudinal damping oscillation waveform, we can also fit the damping time. The figure shows the variation of uh, the longitudinal damping time with the beam current when the harmonic cavity is detuned and working. When the harmonic cavity is detuned, the longitudinal damping time is independent of the beam current. Otherwise, it has a linear decrease relationship with the beam current. A possible reason is that the potential wear distortion caused by the harmonic cavity this leads to an increase of the signature frequency spread. Then the Landau damping becomes the main contributor. Therefore, the change rate of damping time can be used to evaluate the performance of the harmonic cavity. 
Finally, let's make a summary. First, say uh, the methods of evaluating the beam, beam loading effect is precise measurements of bound by bound longitudinal parameters. Then, the commonly used uh, measurement tool uh, is the street camera. It can measure the long longitudinal dis distribution and the central position for each bunch. However, the street camera cannot observe long time events with a high time resolution, and it cannot provide bunch by bunch charge information. So, we proposed a new measurement tool based on the bunch by bunch thread position measurement system to evaluate the beam loading effect. It can analyze, uh, it can ana uh, analyze steady state uh, parameters and uh, dynamic parameters simultaneously. And uh, the uh, analysis uh, results can be checked with each other. The above method was used to measure the beam loading effect before and after the installation of the third harmonic cavity in the SSI. The measurement results match perfectly with the simulation results. In the future, we will build a better model and fit the steady state parameters and the dynamic parameters. And then we can directly derive the parameters, such as the tuning frequency and the harmonic cavity voltage. The last part is acknowledgement. First, thanks to the IB2022, it's my great honor to have the opportunity to make a speech online. Then, I'd like, uh, I'd like to thank the Beam Physics Group and the Beam Operation Group of the SSI. Without their help, I couldn't have made this process. That's all. Thank you for your attention. If you uh, please email me if you have any questions. So let, let's thank Yimei. <laughs> so Yimei is not with us physically, but as you can see, she is now remotely connected. So uh, we can open the floor for questions. Are there any questions in the audience? Maybe I can start with a question, you may, if you like. You, you maybe recall that at the beginning of the talk and I didn't get it. The, w what is the resolution, the beam position resolution you get with your system when you work, you know, in this bunch by bunch mode? Uh, so I, th I think we don't hear you. Little technical problem for the moment. I'm sorry, you may, uh, we actually don't hear you in the in the room, so I'm sure the team is working on it. Could you just let me know you, it's going to work or, or not? Okay. It was the beauty of a pre-recorded talk. We were on time. <laughs> now that's. So in the meantime, is there any question in the audience? I, I have not seen if there is any. Yeah, sure. Of course. Thanks. coming.
Okay, so I, I'm afraid the time is going. Uh, so don't. Yeah, if you're still connected with Vime, just just thank her again, and hopefully we will see her face to face in another occasion. But then I'm afraid we'll have to uh, to move forward. Okay, sorry for that, and uh, and it's okay. It's back. It's back on. <laughs> Yime, do you hear us? Okay. Uh, uh. So last try, if we don't manage, I'm sorry, we will have to actually move forward. And then uh, we don't do. Okay. So yeah, please, if you with you may tell her that we uh, we will catch up with her later, and we thank her for for her talk. So in the meantime, yeah. You know, as we all know, these things happen, unfortunately. So uh, so now we move forward, and we go uh, and invite now uh, the next speaker. So this is Professor Christophe Schroes, which from the University of Lille in France. So Christophe is a, an associate professor uh, at the laboratory FLAM, which is a part of the Lille University in France. His initial research activities focus on laser dynamics, chaos and pattern formation. And since 2004, he has been developing with Serge Bielieski a novel <coughs> interface between accelerator physics, photonics, and nonlinear dynamics. That team has collaborations with several synchrotron radiation and free electron laser facilities, in particular the UV SOAR in Japan, Superaco and Soleil in France, and CARA and the European XFL in Germany. Recent research in accelerator physics focuses on laser electron bunch interaction, coherent synchrotron radiation, micro bunching instabilities, and the development of photonics based ultrafast diagnostics. And today, Christophe will present us his work about single shot electro-optic detection of bunch shape and terahertz pulses and this using this newly proposed strategy using DEOS or DEOS as you like to call it. So Christos, please. Okay. Thank you. So uh, this work is a collaboration between the group of uh, our group in Lille, in North of France, the group of uh, Bernd Stephen and Christopher Gert at uh, DESI and uh, Baran Jalali at uh, UCLA. So my talk is about uh, non-destructive and uh, single-shot electric field measurement. So it can be used either for uh, bunch shape measurement or uh, terahertz pulse measurement uh, for CSR, uh, CTR, or FEL. So the motivation are uh, multiple. Uh, the first one was uh, first we start in this field uh, to study uh, micro bunching instabilities. Uh, in storage ring. In fact, we wanted to study the microstructure in a long e electron bunch. So we did uh, some work at uh, Soleil and, and CARA. Christophe, and I'm, I'm sorry, could you yeah. please a bit? This, yeah, so, uh, and now we are studying uh, single shot measurement for, le, for uh, bunch shape uh, measurement. So I will present some results at uh, European XFL. And we are also interested uh, to uh, terahertz science application. So I will uh, briefly uh, recall what is the principle of uh, electro-optic sampling. So the electro-optic sampling is based on the, the Pockels effect. So here is, if I can, does it work? It's difficult to use here. Yeah. So here is the electric field I want to analyze. So it, it will, I send it on the electro-optic crystal. It will induce a birefringence and we probe this birate functions using a uh, laser pulse. So this pulse is uh, li linearly po polarized. And uh, so after, uh, after interaction, the, uh, the polarization becomes elliptic and the ellipticity uh, depends on the electric field. We measure using a wave plate and polarizer and we, uh, then the output will depend on the terahertz field. So by scanning the uh, laser pulse, you can uh, reconstruct the, the electric field. So this method uh, is well known, huh? it's quite old, but it's not a single shot. 
to have a single shot operation. The idea is to use the chirp pulse. So you you chirp you add dispersion to chirp your uh, laser. Oh, very difficult to okay. So to to have uh, several picoseconds, then you uh, the electric field will modulate this uh, chirp pulse, and then you just have to uh, use a, a spectrum analyzer, single shot spectrum analyzer. So the quick key questions with this system are the can we reach uh, high repetition rate? So uh, at Soleil or Cara, we need uh, to be able to record a million of uh, bench shapes per second. And uh, what is the uh, temporal resolution achievable? So first, I will say a few words about uh, high repetition rate, spectrum uh, analyzer. So the, there are two options. The first one is to use a uh, high-speed camera, like the one uh, developed by uh, the group of uh, Michele Cassel at uh, KIT. With this kind of camera, you can uh, record uh, four, four million uh, frames per second. It's terrific. And uh, it is used at uh, European XFL, CARA, and Flash. The second option is to use uh, what we call photonic uh, time, time stretch. The idea is to add a lot of dispersion uh, to your, to your uh, stretch pulse so that it uh, reaches a nanosecond. And then you can record with a fast oscilloscope and detectors. So in this case, the replica on your oscilloscope will be uh, temporally stretched and uh, by a factor equal to the uh, ratio between the second dispersion over the first dispersion. In this case, for example, if you have a first fiber of uh, 10 meters, a second fiber of uh, two kilometers, the magnific magnification factor is uh, 200. So that means that 5 gigahertz on your oscilloscope correspond to 1 terahertz in uh, the input. So we use this uh, device uh, for study at Soleil and uh, at CARA. So now we'll move to, to time uh, resolution limitation. So uh, hardware limitation. So laser are limited to uh, commercial laser, iterbium are roughly uh, tens of uh, femtoseconds. Uh, Electroptical crystal can work, at, uh, for example, for uh, GAP around uh, up to uh, 11 terahertz. So in fact, the main time resolution uh, limitation is not due to hardware limit. If you uh, here make, uh, made some uh, simulation, in above you have uh, impute terahertz signal, and below are, you have a uh, measured uh, simulation of a uh, measured signal. For long pulse, uh, whether long pulse, the output is similar to the impute. But if you go to short pulse, uh, you see uh, that the output is uh, strongly deformed. In fact, it has been also observed experimentally at European XFL, where there is a EO uh, setup at, uh, after the second bunch compressor. You see uh, they expect to see uh, a Gaussian pulse of uh, 200 femtoseconds. And in fact, they, they saw uh, this kind of uh, signal. In fact, it's a well-known problem. It's, uh, it's called, uh, uh, in fact, you have a, a, a roughly uh, 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 relation. Uh, the resolution is equal to the square root of the uh, uh, duration of the window you, you uh, want to, uh, you have of, of your uh, stretch pulse to the uh, times the duration of, of your femtosecond laser. For example, if you have a, Analyzing window of 10 picoseconds and a laser of uh, 100 femtoseconds, your resolution is limited to one picosecond. So, can we uh, invert uh, this problem? In fact, can we retrieve the input field from the measurement, uh, even if it's deformed? So, Y1 and Y2 are the two polar regions you want to measure. And uh, first, we, we go in Fourier space so that we can deal with a uh, transfer function. You can uh, calculate an analytically the transfer function for, for the setup, and you find that the H1 is the, polarization for the transfer function for one polarization is equal to uh, H1 cosinus uh, B omega square plus phi, 
plus phi, and of the same for uh, H2, and uh, H1, small H1, and small H2, and phi1 and phi2 depend on the crystal and wave plate orientation. B is related to the uh, laser chirp. So, if you look at uh, what happened for uh, classical crystal and, and wave plate orientation, you find this. Uh, so, classical orientation is uh, you have uh, your laser uh, polarization and electric uh, field which are parallel and uh, parallel to the uh, some axis of the crystal. And uh, the, uh, the quarter wave plate is at uh, 45 degrees. In this case, so the transfer function is like this. You see that you have a zero. So that means it, it, it's impossible with a single channel to make deconvol deconvolution. That's why it's okay you, if, you are, you, if you have a, a broad pulse, the spectrum is relatively narrow, so you can uh, deconvolve. But if you have a very short pulse, the, the spectrum is very large, so you, you have a zero and you cannot, it, it cannot work. So, uh, and in particular, for uh, classical optical uh, optics adjustment, H1 and H2 are the zero are at the same position. So, can we change this? So, the, the answer is yes, and we call this uh, diversity uh, electro-optic sampling. Diversity is uh, referred to, to some work in, uh, in antenna theory and uh, time, uh, time stretch theory. So, the, for example, if you use uh, crystal and uh, wave plate orientation that are different from the classical one, you can have this, you can interleave the transfer function zeros. And for example, you can have this uh, two function with, uh, in this case, for example, the minimum of one polarization correspond to the maximum of uh, the other polarization. With, in this case, you will be able to reconstruct. If you uh, combine the two, uh, polar, uh, the two signal, Y1 and Y2, with uh, optimal weight, for example, with this formula here, you can reconstruct the pulse. So here I show some simulation. Uh, so very difficult. So the two different pulse, we use this transfer function and we can recover. So in uh, in red is the impute uh, field and uh, in uh, in black it's the uh, retrieve uh, field. It's very contrary. We can also uh, study the uh, achievable temporal resolution. Here I plot the duration of the retrieval input pulse versus the duration of the actual input pulse. And you see that it evolves linearly and you go well below the uh, classical limit. And in fact, it's twice the uh, pulse duration. And you can also, uh, it works for uh, very uh, long uh, time and, uh, analysis window. So we test this uh, stuff at, uh, experimentally. Uh, tabletop, we made some tabletop experiment. So with a uh, 800 nanometer uh, femtosecond laser. So we create uh, terahertz, and then we, we uh, analyze with uh, electron electroptics uh, sampling setup. So on the camera, you have uh, three lines. The top and the bottom one are the two polarization, and in the middle you have a, a red unmodulated reference to be able to, um, uh, have to to get rid of the fluctuation from pulse to pulse. So the, you have the two deformed uh, polarization uh, signal, and we are able with our algorithm to reconstruct the, uh, the, the pulse. We checked that it was it worked because. Uh, uh, in, in green, uh, it's the, the scan, the uh, uh, sampling signal, uh, used uh, when you, we remove uh, the stretcher and uh, change the delay. So we, we use this setup, uh, we, this algorithm at uh, European XFEL. So the, uh, here are the, in two configurations, the first one is uh, time stretch. So the, the, the we add a fiber after uh, here after the, the signal and uh, after and then a fast oscilloscope. Here are the two polarization and the reconstructive signal. Uh, so 
Here, the, the signal is uh, in the uh, measure 280 uh, femtoseconds. The bump here seems to be uh, due to uh, Wakefield. In the second configuration, in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's with a Calypso camera. Uh, so uh, here, again, you have the two polarization. The signal is deformed, and we can re reconstruct the, uh, the, the signal. So you see here the timing of a different bunch. And uh, here, uh, snapshot, uh, the different uh, EO signal uh, for, the, for the different bursts and uh, for one bunch. And we can study, for example, the uh, jitter of one bunch, uh, of uh, the different bunch in uh, one burst. And you see, for example, here that the, the jitter is, uh, is around uh, 60 femtoseconds uh, and the, the pulse duration is around uh, uh, 200 femtoseconds. So to conclude, uh, diversity uh, electric optic sampling uh, provide you uh, high resolution, so it, it, then it will be limited to the laser and crystal. For arbitrarily, arbitrarily long windows, we made some pre preliminary tests at uh, European XFL and also uh, tabletop test. It's relatively easy to upgrade from uh, an existing uh, EO diagnostic and, uh, to the DIOS uh, setup. There are some uh, ongoing uh, projects, uh, so still with DAISY, Terra Fermi, uh, Terra's beamline at Fermi, uh, and CARA, and also uh, Elbe. So uh, we would like also uh, to make some, uh, use this uh, device to make some uh, single shot uh, time domain spectroscopy for uh, uh, rapidly varying phenomena. And also uh, this setup, single shot uh, uh, EO, uh, can you, is very useful for very low repetition rate. Uh, it's not possible to scan uh, if you have a system that works at uh, 10 Hz. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Christophe. <laughs> and thanks for staying perfectly on time. So I think that we, we have the time for a few questions. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes, I see one here, Patrick. Thank you. Um, you mentioned here in the conclusion the resolution is limited by the laser and the type of crystal. Can you say something about uh, the influence of how far the crystal is from the beam, so the geometry? From? The, the distance of the crystal from the beam axis, and also if the crystal is mounted inside the vacuum or behind a window, which might also limit the frequency response. So here, for example, at, uh, so you mean here uh, at uh, European XL. So the crystal is uh, in vacuum. So it's uh, directly in vacuum. And uh, I think it's the whole millimeter from the, from the beam. So w one millimeter? One millimeter from the beam. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I may have one, you know, if there are no other questions in the room. The, it's, it's very nice, you know, uh, work on, on uh, trying to understand the, the fundamental limits. Th this now is, of course, based on the knowledge of your transfer function. Do you, do you have a way to experimentally check if, you know, for a given crystal that you will buy and receive, if the transfer function that you have is actually the right one, or the transfer function you compute is, is the right one? In, in fact, we, we check uh, to, to what we do when we analyze uh, to reconstruct. Yeah. Each time we uh, multiply the measured signal with the signal we, by, by the transfer function, and we make some fit with, uh, so that we, we know that it converges and it's, it's okay. Okay, because then the transfer function itself, if you vary the crystal thickness, for example, is, is changing by a large yeah. amount, I guess. Yeah. Okay. But each time we, we have for uh, experiment, we fit. First we fit to, to find the good parameter. Okay. Especially for, uh, for B and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and Phi. And then we, we can uh, analyze all the data. 
So it can be very quickly. When the first uh, guess is, is long and after it's very quick. Since you have all the parameters, you have just... Uh, yes, sir. okay. Thanks a lot, Christophe. Last chance for a question? Ah, yes, Simon here, Gunther. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, on one of your earlier slides, you showed us that there are these two analyzer setups, the one with the camera and the grating, and the other one with the time stretching yeah. and then the oscilloscope. Can you expand a little bit on the abilities, differences between those two systems as far as you can say? So uh, I would say for, for this uh, one, uh, for the first one with high-speed camera, commercial camera uh, are limited to uh, 800 of uh, kilohertz. So you need uh, to be involved with this guy to, to buy this, cam this kind of camera. So you also, uh, this version uh, is 4 million uh, frames per second. There, there will be a new, a new uh, version that will go up to uh, 10 mega frames per second. And uh, you can choose uh, also, I think it will, the new version will have uh, the possibility to have uh, 1,000 pixels. And so you need to, to, to contact uh, Michele. You can buy uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, concerning the photonic time stretch, uh, in fact, it's here in this uh, setup, so the, we, the, the stretch pulse is around uh, several nanoseconds or four nanoseconds. That means that you need a fat, very fast oscilloscope. So it's quite expensive. It's, uh, we, the first experiment were done with uh, uh, 36 gigahertz oscilloscope. So it's uh, quite. Uh, but now we are trying. We are uh, working on uh, use to, to put more stretch to uh, have very long pulse, so that we can use very uh, commercial, very uh, cheap oscilloscope. So we 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 are starting to make experiments with uh, one gigahertz oscilloscope. Uh, by using uh, the equivalent of uh, 80 uh, kilometers of fiber. So, uh, but we work at uh, different wavelengths to, to, so that it works. So. so the only limitation is then that the longer you stretch, maybe you get a bit less signal, but you maybe can afford that. But also, of course, the longer you stretch, the further your shots need to be spaced because if you stretched your pulse yeah. from uh, after you have seconds to you have, microseconds. Uh, if your uh, bunch are separated by, by uh, mm. some... Uh, delay, you, uh, some duration, you cannot stretch too, too much. So. But in terms of the, the amount of fiber you need for that stretch, and that's still manageable. You know, you don't need hundreds of kilometers of fiber. But in fact, you, now we are making experiments at uh, 1.5 microns with uh, telecom uh, equipment, and so it's very cheap. Uh, to, okay. So you can have the equivalent of uh, uh, Stretch to uh, 100 of uh, 200 of nanoseconds for uh, 1,000 euros. So it's uh, so it can thank be you very much. cheap. So thank you. I think that now we need to move on. Thanks a lot, Christophe. Thanks again. And this is now my pleasure to invite the last speaker of the session, Arnold Kuczynski, for the Metrology Light Source in Berlin. So Arnold is a PhD student working at the Elmod Centrum Berlin, uh, and he's working on steady state microbunching project at the Metrology Light Source. He completed a bachelor at the Free University of Berlin and a master at the Humboldt University of Berlin. His PhD work focuses on storage ring design, operation, and optimization, and he's also involved in beam diagnostics, such as beam imaging techniques or bunch length measurements using strict cameras. And today, he will present his work and the progress on the steady state microbunching experiment at the MLS. Please. Thank you, Thibault, for the very nice introduction, and also thank you, to, thank you to all for having me and your interest in in, this, in my work. Um, yeah, so I'd like to talk a bit about the uh, steady-state microbunching proof-of-principle experiment that is being conducted at the Metrology Light Source in Berlin, and uh, I will focus a bit on uh, on the different uh, storage ring uh, diagnostics we employ uh, to support this experiment, and also. Um, most of all, on the um, new uh, synchrotron radiation detection scheme we have uh, employed, which is really now advancing the uh, progress of this experiment. So um, first, let me talk a bit about the idea and the mechanism. What is steady-state microbunching? So uh, steady-state microbunching, or SSMB, has been first uh, proposed 
uh, 10 years ago by Daniel Ratner and Alex Chow. And it's an idea to um, generate coherent radiation from microbunched radiation inside a storage ring. So um, the, uh, the motivation is a bit uh, that, of course, there's a rising demand for uh, high power light sources uh, for science and also industrial applications. One important thing is here photolithography for computer chip, uh, computer chip manufacturing. And yeah, so the idea of SSMB is a bit to basically combine the best of both worlds of FELs and storage rings. So we, will ha we would have, what is proposed is to have a high peak power from a coherent radiation source as we know it from FELs, but also make use of the high repetition rate of stor inherent to storage rings, which would uh, um, yeah, combine to have a very high average power source. And uh, yeah, it is proposed that this uh, scheme could um, generate coherent radiation at wavelengths up to the EUV range, which would be very useful again for lithography applications possibly. Um, so a bit about the general principle, the idea basically is to scale, to scale down the entire uh, longitudinal focusing mechanism which uh, is employed in conventional storage rings to generate the bunching structure. So the idea is to replace basically the radio frequency cavity which um, uh, yeah, creates the normal um, normal bunch structure with a, with a, with a laser modulator, uh, with a laser resonator at optical wavelengths and thereby scaling down um, yeah, the bunch structure over a, a few orders of magnitude up to six orders of magnitude. And this would then of course allow, allow us to generate coherent radiations at much shorter wavelengths than before. Um, yeah, so this concept is being um, investigated in a proof of principle experiment at the Metrology Light Source. Um, yeah, I could say it's being successful. It's being successfully evaluated, and um, maybe f first a few words about the metrology light source. So, this is a, a small, medium, small, uh, more or less low energy <laughs> storage ring, which is located in Berlin Adlershof, right next to uh, the Bessie II storage ring. Um, yeah, we have we are operating at energies uh, up to 630 MeV. Um, this is a this is a full-time user operation machine which is owned by the Netro National Metrology Institute of Germany, the PTB, and is uh, and is used as a uh, as a radiation source standard for metrology applications. Um, so when I when I say full-time user I, I, user time, I don't mean 24/7. But what I want to say is that we have to rely on um, on dedicated uh, machine commissioning shifts for our experiments. Um, so what makes the MLS suited for this experiment? Um, it's, it's actually the only storage ring in the world at the moment where we can do this, this type of experiment because this is the first storage ring that has been optimized uh, for so-called low alpha operation which uh, means a very low momentum compaction factor which, um, yeah, which allows to create very short bunches and uh, um, in, this, in this low alpha operation mode we can generate coherent radiation in the terahertz regime. Um, What's making the MLS special is additional octopole, uh, additional sextopole and octopole families, which allow us to control um, to, f uh, to control the higher order momentum compaction and allows us to very precisely tune the longitudinal phase space, which is needed for this SSMB experiment. So, just maybe as a number, um, in standard operation, the momentum compaction factor alpha is, uh, is, uh, is about 0.05, and in the low alpha operation, which is also used for SSMB, this is brought down to. Uh, Around 10 to the minus five. Um, yeah, a bit about what we, what uh, we are doing with this proof of principle experiment. So the the this is a yeah this is a very initial first try of the SSMB principle. So what we have is uh, an, an infrared laser, which uh, we have just uh, it's, it's a it's a commercial off the shelf laser with a 5 nanosecond pulse length and a pulse energy of around 100 millijoules and it's a very slow repetition rate laser. So in this first stage we just look at single shot modulation. So what we do is we have these laser pulses and we uh, insert them into the undulator straight of the MLS and uh, bring the laser beam into co-propagation with the electron beam inside the undulator. Um, the undulator gap is set such that, there is a, that there's resonance between the electron motion and the laser beams allowing the electric field of the laser uh, to imprint an energy modulation uh, onto, the, uh, um, onto the electrons, to the electron bunches. And then by very careful tuning of the uh, storage ring parameters, 
which is uh, driven in a quasi-asynchronous mode and at very low alpha, very low momentum compaction. Um, after, uh, yeah, so we use the storage ring optics that after one turn around the storage ring, these, these energy modulations are transform, transformed into a physical micro-bunching. And then we aim to uh, detect the coherent radiation which uh, the ele these micro-bunched electrons will then emit when they travel through the undulator again. So, um, yeah, so um, <laughs> a, a large issue with this setup in the first place was that because we only have one single undulator at the MLS, we have to use this both for modulation with the laser and also f to observe the radiation one turn later. And this, of course, means that the laser pulse, which has been used for modulation, is also present on the undulator beamline. Um, and because because the laser pulse is many orders of magnitude brighter than the synchrotron radiation we want to detect, uh, it quite naturally sa will saturate any detector we put into the undulator beamline. And so, in a, in a very first try, this was uh, uh, attempted to be overcome by observing the second undulator, radi uh, undulator harmonic, so at 532 nanometers. Um, yeah, for detection here, we uh, simply we employ uh, fast photodiodes, uh, indium gallium arsenide for the infrared and uh, silicon photodiode for the uh, green second harmonic radiation. So, despite these shortcomings, we were able to observe uh, coherent radiation on the second harmonic path and thereby f f f firstly proving the general uh, concept is working and these findings allowed us for an initial publication in Nature, actually. Um, so let me f let me first show you a bit what's the uh, the usual signature of radiation we use. Can I get this up here? Yeah. So first, if you look at the top row, these are just uh, for reference. This is the incoherent radiation of a bunch train of 20 bunches, which we can see uh, at the undulator wavelength at the undulator beamline when we are not using the modulation laser. So this is the normal uh, synchrotron radiation. Then when we use when we switch on the modulation laser and look for the radiation that's being emitted one turn later. The synchrotron radiation shows that here these central bunches show a clear uh, yeah, increase in amplitude and these bunches are exactly the ones which have been hit by the laser. Uh, it's just here on the left side these are raw data and on the right it's, a bit, it's, uh, it's average data over several laser shots to show a more clean signal. And what we can then do is insert a narrow bandpass filter in the t into the detection path and what you can see is that the radiation of these central modulated bunches it sh is only slightly reduced, whereas the radiation from the unmodulated bunches is, is, is uh, strongly suppressed. So this shows that the uh, co coherent radi well the, co the radiation is very narrow banded, which is an indication of its coherence. And also one of the first things we did is to confirm the quadratic scaling of the amplitude of this radiation with the electron beam current or the number of radiating particles which is of course uh, a sign of its uh, coherent radiation. So now which what has actually been my master's thesis is to develop now um, a detection scheme which could operate on the first harmonic. So everything as I said we were only looking at the higher harmonic and uh, which is of course an, an, not a good thing to have uh, for, for the future. So um, yeah, what, what, I, what, I, what I developed is um, a first uh, a detection scheme which uses epochal cells as, uh, as electro-optical modulators. We have seen this actually in a few talks to, uh, in this conference. So I think you know the general mechanism. So we, 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 we can use this to switch very fast between uh, attenuation and full transmission allowing us to block the laser, the, the modulation laser and then after one, one turn to the storage ring or 160 nanoseconds we can allow the um, synchrotron radiation to pass. So actually we, I needed th three stages of focal cells to it, it, um, achieve the needed attenuation of one to the of a factor of 10 to the minus nine. And uh, yeah, so this setup has been installed at the beamline last year and has been used very successfully since then. We are now even considering an expansion with the grating spectrograph to um, investigate the uh, spectral uh, properties of the, of the radiation. Um, now maybe just quickly, how does the radiation we observe look now? Actually, 
uh, you can see here on the top that the laser pulse is still a very large signal on the diode which is still saturated by the laser pulse but now it's uh, not destroying the detector anymore and uh, it's also the decay time is fast enough that we have much long time until then the uh, coherent radiation after one turn through the storage ring can be observed here. So what we have found of course on the first harmonic we have now much uh, larger signals over two orders of, mag uh, of two orders of magnitude stronger signals which allows for better statistics um, but most importantly the coherent signal can be reproduced and optimized much more reliably so what we have found is that the uh, storage ring state we have to uh, we have to uh, apply to get uh, this uh, coherent radiation at the second harmonic is very fragile and only in a very, very narrow uh, read range of parameters so it was very very hard to find it to find it and to do any physics uh, any experiments with it and now it's much more easy to uh, to vary machine parameters over a much wider range without losing the signal and we can investigate a much larger parameter space of the machine um, another inter interesting thing we saw very early on with this setup is that we actually have a coherent signal on further revolutions around the storage ring. So after two revolutions, after three revolutions, which was something we did not expect at all. So there are many interesting things to, to still be um, found here. Yeah, so now we, now we can really do systematic analysis of the SSMB state. Um, yeah, a few words to um, yeah, uh, what we are what we have been doing. Um, a very important thing to to um, to look to look for here is that because we are at so low momentum compaction, we actually have a very um, complex longitudinal phase space. So uh, what you have to see is that the uh, alpha, uh, the momentum compaction, is actually not a constant, and this becomes uh, so it's actually a function of the momentum deviation of the particles, and this becomes very important at low momentum compaction. So these higher orders of alpha become very important and actually give, give rise to additional uh, buckets in the phase space, the so-called alpha buckets, which arise not at zero crossings of the momentum deviation, but at zero crossings of the alpha function. And uh, yeah, so first maybe we are using a multitude of diagnostics to, dis to distinguish uh, in which of these bucket types the electrons are. So some important things are of course orbit measurement with the BPM so what you can see here is, uh, is a dispersive orbit which give, uh, we see this dispersive pattern due to the dispersion in the uh, magnet sections which uh, is, is such because there is a negative uh, this, is, this is indicative of a negative uh, momentum deviation which would be a typical for an electron which is in this what we call the B minus bucket which is at such as, which is an alpha bucket at negative uh, momentum deviation. So we have here, for example, these are these alpha buckets which we call B plus and B minus. These are at positive and negative uh, momentum deviation actually. And another thing uh, which is very important for us is to look at the synchrotron tune spectrum which at the MLS is measured uh, with, the phase, with, the, with the phase monitor which compares the, yeah, the, the phase of the longitudinal motion to the uh, master oscillator of the of the machine and what we actually can see from time to time is these double peaks on the spectrum so we can actually discern uh, the different tune uh, synchrotron tunes of the of the different buckets and this is of course also a very important measure um, of w uh, in which buckets the electrons are in why am, why am I telling you this because what we have found a very fundamental thing um, is that we were only able to um, to generate coherent SSMB radiation in one specific bucket, which is the B minus bucket in our case. Um, yeah, so this is something we are still investigating why this is. We have not really understood it yet, but uh, yeah, of course, without these diagnostics, this would not be possible. Um, yeah, um, another thing which is very important for us is bunch length measurements. We have a street camera set up, which we can use to uh, yeah, measure the bunch length. Uh, I have shown here just quickly a measurement uh, comparing this B minus and B plus alpha buckets and actually what we can see um, so this is the in, in vertical this is the longitudinal direction uh, of the street camera image and it uh, is clear that the B minus bucket actually 
has a shorter um, bunch length than the P plus bucket. It's not much. Um, and again, coherent signal has only been observed in this type of bucket and not in this one. Again, not clear why. Actually, if you look at the um, phase space diagram, the um, yeah, if it, it so it's it, the phase space looks maybe something like this, and it's clear that the B minus is, has a smaller acceptance and has a smaller uh, viable bunch length. Um, yeah. Okay, so my time is almost up. Maybe I can come to the conclusion. So. Um, we have been successfully uh, successful in observing coherent radiation from a microbunched electron beam in a storage ring. So, essentially, we have already been uh, successful in proving the general principle of SSMB. But now the real work starts to to understand the dynamics of the storage ring in this special state. So, the new first order detection setup that I've presented. Um, now really allows us the continuation of the SSMB uh, proof of principle experiment. Again, as we can now, uh, yeah, we can observe a very large area of the phase space and everything. And uh, some important new steps. Um, yeah, again, uh, apart from uh, continuing to explore the longitudinal phase space, we need to support the experimental work with uh, uh, more, with with simulations. And. Uh, one important thing actually is to investigate conditions for radiation stability. We still see that in many states the uh, amplitude of the coherent radiation is very unstable from shot to shot. And of course, in a final, in a final application, we would really need uh, the, the users are, have, a, have a large interest in, a, in stable radiation. So we need to find out what are the conditions for this. Maybe a bit to uh, the long-term perspective for the SSMB experiments. So apart from uh, the continuation of the experiments at the MLS, which will also include uh, um, uh, expansion of the experiments in a new phase with a new la modulation laser, uh, we will have uh, we have uh, firmly planned to have um, SSMB proof of principle experiments included in the MLS successor machine MLS2, and possibly there will even be a first application of uh, radiation uh, created in this manner. And in, in, in long term, um, it is planned to have the uh, co construction of a dedicated SSMB storage ring facility, which is um, being planned by our colleagues and our collaboration partners in uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would really like to acknowledge all the partners uh, in the SSMB co collaboration team, which includes uh, Helmholtz Central Berlin, uh, Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt, and our partners in China, especially at Tsinghua University. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Arnold. So I think we have time for one or two questions. I can see one end here. Please. Thank you for a very nice talk. What's the limit on alpha? Can you change alpha and watch the signal go away? Well, I mean, the, the thing is again, this what we use in the normal in the normal operation, we have this one value for alpha, right, which we can bring down. But if we approach zero, uh, at some point, it's it's impossible to just have this one parameter. We really have to uh, look at the higher at the higher orders. And uh, in a way, you could say, in principle, the alpha can go all the way to zero to exactly zero. But then. Um, it's, you cannot say alpha is zero. You have to say alpha, the first order of alpha is zero, and the higher orders are not zero. So um, it's really, at some point, you, you, you cannot only express it with one parameter. So. so if you raise momentum compaction factor to some point, you see the effect go away, presumably. Sorry, I didn't cut. If you raise the momentum compaction, then it goes away completely. Is that correct? If I, if I, if I, so if I raise it to high values, uh, I, I mean, uh, that's not, hmm. I mean, for high values, it's the, that's the standard operation mode, right? Uh, at some point, it's not really interesting to raise it anymore, I say. I say uh, but so the interesting things happen at low momentum compaction, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any, any additional question? If not, I have actually one or two as well. The, when you look, you know, the, the interaction uh, length of, of the system is, uh, 
is, is large. And um, I'm not sure that you, you, you really say yeah. it you know, in details, but... Uh, so, yeah, I guess, I mean, the, the, the undulator, of course, has a length of a few meters. It's a normal physically, length. then the laser is really interacting and over the whole ah, so, length. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, because the, the, the pulse length of the laser is five nanoseconds for the width half maximum. Okay. Uh, the bunch length is two nanoseconds. So we will hit several bunches with the laser. So we, if, you, if you look at the central bunch, this will be modulated more or less by a, okay. not, not constant, but you are at the maximum of the laser pulse, so. And then maybe another question that I had is, you know, when you excite, what is the dynamic of the, you know, micro-bunching instability to uh, how, how many turns does it take to really, you know, materialize? And, and for those bunches who actually get micro-bunch, uh, you know, they emit coherent radiation, which means that, you know, they may also have a slightly different dynamics than the rest. Uh, so do, do you lose them quickly or? No, I, so in this case, this is only single shot modulation, right? So okay. one shot yeah. modulation, after one turn we see the radiation and then it returns to normal. Okay. As, I said, as I said, we have seen uh, um, that it even survives for a few revolutions. This, can, this is also very dependent on what, sta uh, what, um, uh, what exact state we are in. In some states it's only, f only first turn, maybe a little bit on the second and we have even seen, uh, we have even seen coherent signal up to 30 or 40 turns in specific situations. Okay. But afterwards, the beam just returns to normal. So if so you would have a higher reposition rate laser, you could indeed kind the of final idea. The, 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 and the, the final the idea for steady state microbunching, of course, is to have that's, the that's turn the the modulation state. every turn, <laughs> and then this is the SS. Okay, to reach a stable, stable state, a sustainable state. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. So last chance for a question. Yes, you want Patrick and ah, two questions. Right. Yes, really nice uh, synthesis between uh, FEL and storage ring physics. I really like seeing those uh, little alpha buckets in longitudinal phase space. What wasn't clear to me was, uh, does the laser modulator actually replace the conventional RF, or do they work together? Yeah, it's a bit, I mean, in our case, we of course still have the RF. Uh, this is only for the proof of principle experiment. In the final, a dedicated SSMB storage ring, it's actually, I think there are still um, different approaches to, uh, uh, under investigation, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that you could in principle only have the laser modulator, which then would also uh, supply the uh, turn by turn, uh, supply, uh, resupply the synchrotron radiation losses. This but should op operationally at the moment you inject with the conventional RF and then you ramp up the laser system. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, at the moment, it's a really conventional storage ring, which additionally has this laser shot that we induce but, everything else. But you ramp down the conventional RF and... No, so no, 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 no. You have them both on. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Oh, okay. Otherwise, we would lose the beam. This is just, again, it's only a single shot modulation. Only for one turn, the laser interacts with the beam. So it's not in any way... Uh, yes. That's what I was trying to understand. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. I think that's... Last, last one, Gunther, I think you, you raise your hand. Just one question. I think on slide five, you showed us the, the uh, quadratic relationship, but the charges at the bottom scale are still, well, I might call them, fairly minute. We're reaching half a picocoulomb. What happens further to the right to going to higher charges? Very good question, very good question. Um, so, in general, we see that only for lowest currents we are in a, a as I say, more or less stable regime where we can observe this quadratic scaling. If you, if you increase the current at some point, you really get, it gets more or less unstable. The, uh, also, I mean, this curve will just go up and down even and at some point reach a linear scale because, um, yeah, it's also not quite clear how this transition occurs. It, it might even have to, be, have to do with uh, that not all bunches, uh, not all electrons are in the correct bucket. Yeah? And only for lowest currents, they settle into the B minus bucket. But of course, there are a lot of instabilities that occur at higher currents in this state, and these basically destroy the clean quadratic scaling at some point. So I think we thank Arnold again. Thanks again for this nice presentation, and congratulations to your work.